Hi, my name is Patrick and I'm a lead solution developer at InterSystems. In this video, I'm going to talk about word embeddings, what they are, some of the methods that are used to create them, and how some of those methods have been developed over time to solve the unique problems of modeling language. In some of the previous videos in this series, we've talked about very practical, hands-on matters of using word embeddings uh, for use in vector search or using within vector search uh, within a RAG application uh, and integrating it with an LLM. But in this video, I'm going to take a more general approach. I'm going to talk about word embeddings, what they, uh, what they represent, what the meaning of that embedding is supposed to be, how those things are created, and more importantly, how it's related to a language model. My hope is that this will give you a more robust mental framework about embeddings so that this can inform later technical decisions in terms of asking yourself the right question and looking at your particular use case in order to figure out what you need to know to choose the right, typically embedding libraries or APIs to use to solve your use case. I'm going to break it down into three sections. First is going to be what are embeddings. So, we're going to talk a little bit about vectors, a little bit about why we use vectors, and then also a little bit about the important features of them, not completely about how we generate them, but what the point of generating them is and what we're trying to achieve. Then we're going to talk about what are language models. The term language model seems very generic, but it actually has a very specific meaning. And once we learn the relationship between language models and embedding models, it'll help us to reason about both of them. And the third is, once we understand these first two points, what are the problems of language modeling? Right? There are some natural things. Language is pretty unique, and it offers up some very specific challenges uh, in terms of modeling. And when we look at it from that perspective, we see a lot of the history is just trying to address those unique problems of modeling language. Okay, in the first section we're going to talk about just what are embeddings, right? And specifically, I'm going to be talking about what are word embeddings. Word embedding being a very uh, a sub case of text embeddings. I'm using words as a as a boundary, uh, so the examples will all be in words, but this generally can be uh, extended to text. It's an interesting note that embeddings are not specific to text. They were actually used in other modeling and very successfully in, uh, in images much earlier on than text. So this, this format, at least, uh, is not specific to text, but that's what we'll be focusing on. So an embedding is a vector, a vector being uh, something that comes from uh, the, the mathematics of linear algebra. But really, we can just think of a vector as having the shape of a, a list or an array of numbers, right? Um, in this case, we have two I'm showing you here. There are five dimensions in both of these. Uh, sometimes we can call these features, uh, each dimension being a feature. Those features don't necessarily map to something we can interpret. It doesn't necessarily map, in the case of language, to a part of speech or a, you know, some characteristic of the thing. Um, these are five dimensions, but in the real world, we'd probably be using something uh, of the order of magnitude of, of hundreds or thousands of actual features. So we can think of them as features. We just can't, but more in the math, a little bit of an abstract mathematical sense. So in this case, we have dog and pet. Um, we are going to look at these. Uh, we're going to look at these smashed down into two into two dimensions, uh, and that's what I have here. This is the most familiar. This is what everybody learns in school, right? The the two dimensional Cartesian plane. Uh, you might not remember that as as this, but these points that we see that that corresponds to to some number, if this is one on the plane and this is one, then that would be one, one, right? And that's the equivalent of a vector one, one. Um, the important point here, what this allows to see really, is that 
these can be related. We understand uh, visually that pet and dog are very close, and they're farther from orange, and orange from ri river are, are far apart. And this is the most critical piece, uh, this is the most critical feature of vectors. We can compare two vectors and determine their distance between each other. So now we can say how similar are these vectors in a mathematical sense. We have word representations. Now we can say how similar are these words. So how do we create these? We'll go a little bit more into how they're created, but the way to think about these is that the word itself, the vector is created by the similarity in context to the text. So if two words appear between the same words all the time, then they will be similar vectors. So we often think of those as maybe a synonym, right? Words that can easily replace another word. Any word that could automatically be substituted will have a very similar vector. So what are language models? The lang term language model seems like a, a very generic term, but it actually has a very specific meaning. Here's a couple of definitions that uh, I particularly like because they're, they're uh, concise and, uh, and practical. A model that assigns probabilities to sequences of words. And this is my favorite. A language model is essentially a next word predictor. So what we're trying to do with these language models is just predict the next word. We're just trying to figure out what words come together. And how we're trying to do that is just to use raw text, right? So we want to take text and say, given that text, what words will we co-occur as a word that they commonly turn? Find the co-occurrences. But it turns out that's a very hard problem. It's essentially infinite. Uh, the number of possible valid sentences are essentially infinite. If there's 100,000, they say maybe 200,000, words in the English language, you can see very quickly that the number of possible words that could co-occur in a sentence is never, is not something you could ever compute. So how do we solve that, right? How do we solve an infinite problem? And that's where obviously machine learning is very strong. And that's where the neural networks came in uh, to language models uh, to help solve these problems. Uh, here's a quote, this is actually the opening abstract from what is considered the grandfather of neural network language models, which are the, the, really the, the, the grandfather to all large language models that you know today. This is a paper from 2003. A goal of statistical language modeling is to learn the joint probability function of sequences of words. Predict the next word. This is intrinsically difficult because of the curse of dimensionality. So again, this model that you see here is from the original paper. You don't need to understand this model. I just wanted to make the point that what they're trying to solve with these language models is a problem that's infinite. So they need to figure out an efficient way to do this. If you look at this uh, model here, you'll see this circled area, that represents what we today know as embeddings. At the time, embedding models were not pulled out and separate models. They were actually just part of the language model itself, part of what was predicting what was the next word. So we know that neural networks are a good possible solution to optimizing this problem or an efficient way of, of computing these probabilities. That's why they use them, right? That's why they decided to use them. It would be about another 10 years before uh, Mick, Thomas Mikulov published a paper uh, and the uh, accompanying library called word to vec You probably or you may have heard of this. It's one of the most well-known uh, libraries in, in the history of word embeddings. Um, it was uh, succeeded for the first time in really creating an efficient process, an efficient algorithm for generating word embeddings. So, we now have a process that can do this, and this launched the industry in a lot of ways, or not yet an industry, but people started to use this. Well, why? Because now we can generate these, and we know this. We can use them for other things. 
We can generate these as a list, a lookup. I give you a word, you give me the vector, and now I can use this in some other algorithm and or some other language processing uh, that I have and I can, or in some vector search, I can now compare words together in a vector search and have it be very useful. So as we saw, word to vec helped uh, move, the, move the industry along quite a way by creating an efficient process for generating these word embeddings. And this allowed a lot of people to adopt this and to use them in separate processes and other NLP algorithms or NLP, what they call downstream tasks. And all of a sudden, people started finding that they were getting better and better results. However, we had just really scratched the surface of, of the problems with language modelings. We still had a number of very sticky things to, to solve for. No word order. Word to Vec uses typically something called bag of words. And there's, there's a couple of, they use a few different algorithms, one that's called bag of words, which is a little confusing. But essentially a bag of words algorithm in, in language processing means you're not considering the word order, right? So this is a big problem. Obviously, word order matters in language. Um, and we'll see actually some, uh, some of the, uh, not only in just the words, people use uh, man bites dog versus dog bites man is a very are two very different things that would not be uh, differentiated um, the other another very important thing is no long range dependencies so you can imagine sometimes you might use a word and then refer to that word via a pronoun or other thing in sentences or pages away from this. You can only open the window of words that word -to vec is using so much and you'll never capture these long-range dependencies. Okay? Another thing, which is somewhat related to no word order, is no look ahead. And this helps point out another deficiency with uh, word to vec Every word only has one vector. So for uh, a sentence like, I sat on the bank of the river, or I went to the bank to get some money, bank in that, bank is going to have the same vector, but it obviously has very different meaning. Um, if we use look ahead, which models would eventually do, we would then create a vector based on not only the words before it, not only the words that had come before it, but the words in context of that specific sentence. So, these, these three problems make up a lot of what has to be tackled over the next decade and has been solved in, with recurrent neural networks, long, short, long short-term neural networks, and attention mechanisms. So we've talked about quite a few, uh, we've talked about quite a few concepts today. What are embeddings? The fact that an embedding is a vector representation of a word that tries to relate semantic similarity to context similarity. Talked about how word to vec helped to solve that problem uh, by creating an efficient uh, algorithm for computing, uh, for estimating those probabilities how language models and embedding models are inherently related to each other because they're trying to, uh, an embedding model is trying to, or is part of a language model, and is trying to represent that uh, distribution of words. And then, of course, the remaining problems uh, that are currently being addressed by recurrent neural networks or were recurrent neural networks in long short terms, and now by attention mechanisms and transformer models that we know today.